Good evening, lovely people. I am Neil Oliver and I am live, as far as I can tell, on GB News TV and on radio. Tonight, I'll be joined by North West Leicestershire MP Andrew Bridgen, who was one of the first politicians to raise the alarm about the post office scandal that saw hundreds of sub-postmasters wrongly convicted and imprisoned for fraud. He's bringing with him Michael Rudkin, who ran the Ibstock post office. He and his wife lost their jobs and were forced to turn their home into a B&B just to pay the bills. They now want to know who will be held to account for more than a decade of false incrimination and humiliation. And finally, farmers are blocking highways with trucks and tractors in parts of Germany in a week of protests against the German government's budget plans. But we'll be asking, why are they so angry? All of that and lots of chat with our regular panellist, Andrew Eborn. Joining me tonight is my friend, favourite regular panellists, lawyer, futurist, broadcaster, all round good chap, Andrew Eborn. Andrew, you've heard me ranting there. It, it, it feels like politicians the world over are doing whatever they want without fear of consequence. It, it is so worrying, and as you rightly say, the thing about trust, I mean, trust comes in on foot but leaves on horseback. And the reality is trust is at an all-time low in politicians, in the media, and so on and so forth. And talk about the turbocharge cancer, the whole word by its very nature. You say, what's that about? Uh, and it's all to do with fear. So Edward Bernays, the father of PIR, said that the way you sell anything is through fear, the most powerful human emotion. And what we need to look at is actually the positive things, things like AI, which are finding solutions and helping cure diseases yeah, yeah, but and hold so on. And so forth. Where is the turbo cancer coming from? I mean, I can't be the only person that, until a, a few months ago, had never heard of, yeah. of such a thing. Well, you and me both. So the sudden prevalence of turbo cancer, yeah. and lo and behold, a £43 billion deal by Pfizer to pick up a company that has pharmaceuticals to treat turbo cancer. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely doesn't right. That, doesn't that require investigation? Oh, of some course questions? it does. And, and what I love about this show is we always question everything. We don't just regurgitate what we're being peddled. But it's going back to what I was saying about fear. The word turbo cancer means that it's much, much worse than any cancer. Well, it is. Better. And, and cancer always used to be the big C, which was the big scary thing anyway. So turbo cancer, by its very nature, has got to be much worse than anything we've ever imagined. And so where does that come from? I've, I've got no idea. They're not explaining it to us other than turbo Turbo is by the very nature a fear word. So there's, so there's a sequence of events whereby something happens, then there's the rollout of a vaccine, then suddenly we're being talked to about myocarditis, yeah. pericarditis, turbo cancer. And then no, no sooner are we learning to digest those words yes. than Pfizer are acquiring companies to treat yes. those conditions. Absolutely. It's going back to what I was saying beforehand about fear. That's the way you're selling this sort of message. Get really scared, and here's the solution. It's all about that. Edward Bernays, he talked about the Dixie Cups. You might remember about disposable cups. He was engaged to help sell these cups, these disposable ones. And what he said, well, hang about, you're going to get infections by if you keep using the same cup, and therefore we've got to do these disposable ones. And all of a sudden, he said, that's where you've got to tell it. You peddle the message in the media that cups are very bad for you because they're not washed properly, so you've got to get these disposable ones. And that's how it all came about in that first place. Snake oil salesman everywhere you look. We're already at a break, after which I'll be joined by Andrew Bridgen, MP, to talk about his fight to help the sub-postmasters wrongly accused of stealing from the post office. Don't go away. My next guest this evening is MP Andrew Bridgen who has spent the last 10 years and more fighting for justice for the sub-postmasters in his constituency, those who were wrongly convicted of theft by the... or theft from the post office. Andrew joins me now. Good evening, Andrew. Good to see you again. When did you become aware of this exactly and, and in what way? Well, it's actually 14 years ago when I was elected. Within weeks of being elected as a newly Conservative MP, um, I had a surgery appointment booked with Mr and Mrs Rudkin and they told me what at the time appeared to be an unbelievable story of how they were falsely convicted of fraud. They were, they were actually fitted up by the post office and Fujitsu. Um, my constituent Michael Rudkin had been a successful uh, sub-postmaster for years with no problems, a pillar of the local society, uh, community in, in Ibstock. He'd been actually selected as the representative for all the sub-postmasters in the UK. 
He'd gone on a visit to uh, Fujitsu's headquarters in that position. He believed they'd mistaken him for someone else, and they actually took him down into the basement and showed their engineers altering Horizon. This is in 2008. Um, and when they discovered who he was, they threw him out the building. He came back to Ibstock, and very, very shortly afterwards, they were raided, and it was they were accused of taking £44,000 shortfall on the computer, and his wife was convicted of fraud. And it, it's the fact that people die, have died since. Uh, pe people committed suicide because of their desperation and whatever else. People are still in jail. People have n the, the convictions have not all been quashed. What, what on earth is going on that, despite it all being out in the open, people are still languishing under the guilt Oh, of because conviction. Well, there's, there's at least 736 sub-postmasters convicted on Horizon evidence alone. The post office had always maintained it was impossible to alter the uh, computer records in a sub-postmaster's office without them knowing about it. That was untrue, as, as Mr Rudkin had, had uncovered. Uh, and so it was all, always going to be their fault. And there was no glitches in the system, which that was untrue as well. So we knew all those convictions were unsafe by 2014. Um, Oliver Letwin was in the group of five MPs. He was in the Cabinet Office and he was David Cameron's political advisor. I'd have no doubt he was briefing the Prime Minister of the time on something as important as what we'd uncovered. At what point did, th did those in positions to do something about it know that the sub-postmasters were innocent? How long has that been... Well, I, mani I managed to... We, we ambushed the post office. They were maintaining their system was bomb-proof. So I managed to get a, a really diligent forensic accountant uh, who I'd become acquainted with called Ron Warmington of Second Sight. He got in there and very shortly afterwards um, it was clear that uh, the system was very, very leaky and that all those convictions were unsafe. So certainly by 2014 I knew, I believe the government knew, and the post office knew, and the sub postmasters knew. I, I was, I was oblivious to the to the horror of this. However, that said, I mean, on here in this show a couple of years ago now, more than a couple of years ago, we had on uh, Nick Wallace, an, an author who had spent time investigating. I think there's a clip. In 2010, the post office was made aware of the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance and the fact that they had the backing of several MPs. However, they did nothing about it. They denied that anything was wrong until in 2012, a group of independent forensic accountants called Second Sight were brought in by the post office to look at their Horizon computer system. And Second Sight found that there were faults, there were errors. Now, I mean, needless to say, you know, like n nothing happened in the aftermath. Well I, I, well, I told the government, you can't let the post office pay for their own investigation. It's got to be paid by the Cabinet Office, or it's the moment that Ron finds anything and Second Sight find anything, they'll get shut down. And that's exactly what happened. In the end, Ron Warmington, because he's a man of high morals, leaked the unredacted information to me because the post office were redacting all his reports to cover it all up, even at that point in 2012. Andrew, as a lawyer, yes. l l listening to this with your legal hat on, What's your oh, it's instinct It's completely scandalous. I mean, and there's a number of things here. You hear of the tragic cases where people have said, look, if you plead guilty to fraudulent accounting, you may not go to prison. And they be basically people who were innocent were forced to plead guilty. And we always say, baby lawyers, the first thing you're told is better that 99 guilty people get off than one innocent person gets convicted. And it's completely scandalous. The, the whole thing about the fact that it took an ITV drama to bring this to light is extraordinary. What I also have to say, there's a number of other questions that need to be raised in terms of they denied the fact afterwards that he ever visited yep. Fujitsu. I, I, rang, I rang up, to, uh, spoke to Fujitsu, wrote to them and said, I'm writing on behalf of my, my constituent, Mr Rudkin. He says he visited your head office uh, at Bracknell on this date and they first of all claimed that he'd never been on the premises. And then I said, well, he, he, he says he, he claims that he, he signed the visitor's book and, of course, they, they said they'd lost the visitor's book for that day. And the emails all came out, a whistleblower from Fujitsu eventually, and everything that... Uh, the unbelievable story of fraud and false uh, criminalisation that my constituents had told me those years before, everything was true. It is extraordinary. And, and the other thing as well, which hasn't come out yet, is about Adam Crozier. Because Adam Crozier at that time was head of Royal Mail. He, I think from uh, 2003 to 2010, he then went from the head of Royal Mail to ITV. And he doesn't feature at all in the drama. And I don't know why that is. 
Why does it take a drama? What's, that sounds almost farcical, that after all of the testimony, all of the, all of the truth-telling, all the way down the line, why, when a drama goes out on television, does it suddenly tip Well, balance? it was a well-made drama, and it, it pulled on the heartstrings, as the story does. I mean, it's deeply distressing when, when you meet the victims themselves. Um, but the fact is, I find abhorrent, is that I had been to ITV... BBC, Sky, Channel News and all the major newspapers. I had all the evidence that the convictions were unsafe in 2014 and I went for years and nobody would run the story. I said to the journalists, you'll get an award if you run this story. These people are all innocent and here's the proof. No media outlet would run that story. What will it cost to put it right? There's vast amounts of money in terms of legal fees and all of the rest of it. You know, what's the bill and who foots it? It's going to be the taxpayer, whatever happens. Uh, ultimately, the post office is owned by, by the government, so we'll foot the bill. But they've got to have proper compensation. I managed to get the, uh, Mrs Rudkin in the first nine that had her criminal prosecution overturned. Right. And that was in December 2020. Mr and Mrs Rudkin still haven't got their compensation. <sighs> what about Fujitsu? I mean, Fujitsu's a private company and doesn't it carry the well, can I, I think part. the fact that they that they as far as I'm concerned it's no coincidence that after Mr Rudkin uncovered what was going on in 2008 that he's, his wife had suddenly got a, a huge deficit on her computer within within days now that is is is, is criminal hold you on that on that word there that c word there it's a break, after which I'll be joined by sub-postmaster, the man in question that we've been talking about, Michael Rudkin, to talk about his battle for justice. Don't go away. Welcome back. My next guest is Michael Rudkin. Michael ran a post office in Ibstock with his wife, Susan. He was also chair of the National Sub-Postmasters Federation. Their lives changed forever when they were accused of taking £44,000. Michael joins me now. Michael, it's an appalling catalogue of events which we've all been piecing together over the last, whatever, weeks or years, depending. But what has this done to you and Susan? Where are you now physically and emotionally? And I can tell you that emotionally we're both physically drained and wrecked as a result of what's transpired. What's little known is we came into this industry in 1995, Susan and I, and we were privileged to be selected by the post office to actually run a branch, so much so that we were then granted a second branch, of which we ran that as well in conjunction with the uh, other branch. It then came to the point where my sons didn't want to follow on in the business because they were so disillusioned with what was transpiring and they could see what was happening to mum and dad that they chose a different career path. But I, I can only imagine that, you know, traditionally, uh, you would have been regarded as, you know, pillars of the community. You know, the, the, the local post office is a, is a significant place f f for a lot of people. It and, and what it happened to you going from that, you know, a, a pillar to suddenly being accused and put in the spotlight of being a thief? Well, that was a, a very difficult moment in, in my life in particular, because I've got I've got a double-edged sword. One is I've, I appear to have fallen from grace, and B, I'm in a position where I've got to defend the position of my wife because I knew for a fact that Susan hadn't, wouldn't ever take a penny piece from anybody, and yet she, she, there she is, accused. They couldn't get at me but as a union rep, but then they decided they were going to focus their attentions on Susan, and they prosecuted her. And how do you feel about the fact that you've yet to receive any compensation? I mean, or are you getting any kind of apology from anyone about what you went through? Well, I've, I, in particular, have had an interim payment, which is very small. The fact that we've got Susan, who is part of the uh, group that were prosecuted, of which we've got just under a 1,000 that are waiting for their convictions to be overturned, where we've got also... 90-some that have had the convictions overturned, and that's taken up to now 20 years. Are you really asking me to believe that it's going to take another decade before the rest of the sub-postmasters are cleared? Uh, gents, how can this be? How can, when we know that there was... that the people are innocent 
yeah. why are there still outstanding uh, it, it, Absolutely uh, scandalous. Convictions. And that, what, what Sunak was saying this week is they want to basically push forward everything. They're going to forgive everybody, as I understand it. Forgive? Even if, no, that's what the, I know. What the, well, even the, those who may be guilty, they just pardon and say, look, completely exonerated. Because it is scandalous. We, we're chatting in the green room beforehand. It's, what happens, you were vilified in the community as well. And I think you're saying that lots of people who were assumed that you were guilty, they've come and apologised. They're ringing you on your doorbell now, leaving presents and saying just how sorry they are on that sort of thing. But one question I've got in terms of the ITV drama, you talked about Sean Dooley, I think, played you. To what extent were you part of that narrative uh, and actually helping them with writing the script and so on and so forth? Well, uh, it, it's difficult to explain because there were so many different avenues. But I had a Zoom call with Sean yes. because he wanted to get it to grips with my character. He put questions to me to see what kind of reaction he would get so that he would have empathy with that and then to be able to portray it within the dramatisation, of which I have to say, yet again, the guy had done an excellent job, as did the rest of the actors that participated in this programme. I want to cover one other point with you, Andrew, Yes. that you mentioned about the statement from Sunak in Parliament at giving everybody the so-called pardon. Yes. Uh, what is dangerous about this, what we need to see is the detail. The devil is in the detail. And for somebody to stand there and say that we will do this, but we want a statement of innocence for everybody to sign it, and if at some point in the future we think you may have done something wrong, we will be able to come back and have redress against well, that. <laughs> well, we've already experienced you... what happens when the judge sure. and jury becomes the executioner. It's... I wouldn't want to see any of my members, former members, yeah. put in that position So it's again. understandable you wouldn't have faith in the system. What would you like to see happen? somebody to stand there and say that we will do this but we want a statement of innocence for everybody to sign it and if at some point in the future we think you may have done something wrong we will be able to come back and have redress against well, that <laughs> well we've already experienced you... what happens when the judge sure. and jury becomes the executioner it's... i wouldn't want to see any of my members former members yeah. put in that position so it's again. understandable you wouldn't have faith in the system what would you like to see happen what I would like to see happen is for people to get their act together and start issuing proper compensation levels. I hate this term when they say, we want to restore you back to where you were when this started. I'm 66 next in, the, in, a, in a couple of months. I don't want to be back where I, where I was. I want to know how I'm going to fund the next 20 years of my retirement. And it's not Absolutely. with an interim payment of £75,000. We can't, we, can't, we can't have pardons, because you get pardons when you've done something it, wrong. It, you've exactly. forgiven. It's the wrong language. They, they, they've got to be exonerated, because these yeah, people did right. not commit any crimes. And, and also, Andrew, though, the, you know, the technology was trumpeted and put in place by Tony Blair. The whole scandal unfolded under David Cameron's uh, government. You know, Ed Davey, as it turns out, was the postal minister who was simultaneously taking money from the legal firm, chasing the postmistresses falsely and the postmasters. Uh, wh wh who's going to carry the can for this? When will we get somebody who actually stands up and says, this was me, Keir Starmer? you know, was, was in some well, way either public... turning a blind eye or in some way didn't see what was happening. Well, after I got um, Michael uh, a Zoom meeting with Boris Johnson, the then Prime Minister, that's when we got the public inquiry. I, want, I haven't, still haven't given my evidence to the public inquiry. Um, when the evidence is complete, I think we've got to hold all these characters to account, and certainly Fujitsu, certainly ministers, uh, it's what they knew, when they knew it, and why they didn't act. Because this can't be allowed to happen again, and I think history's repeated itself too many times. Yeah. You know, 11 years over thalidomide, 30 years over um, the Gulf War syndrome, um, the, the, the infected blood still not being paid out, those victims. This is deliberate. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. We always say history repeats itself because we don't learn the lessons from history. And this absolute scandal needs to be addressed. But looking at that sort of side, you went to Fujitsu, they tried to hide that. Well, the fact that they turn around and say I didn't exist, I never appeared that day. Right. I mean, that's really pushing the pale. I've signed, signed the invitation book. Security level in that building yes. is absolutely unparalleled on anything I've ever experienced. But then also the shock of being taken down into the boiler room yes. to watch these experiments happening at, at altering remotely branches' accounts. And when challenged and, and specifically asked twice, 
are you doing this real time? Yes. Reply, yes. I need to ask you again, have you, are you doing this real time? Response, yes. I've told my members that no remote access can be uh, done through a remote uh, location. The, the accounts belong to the postmaster and only he can sign them off when completed and you have entered them and of, remotely. And, of course. and then, to be ushered out of the building as though I'm some common criminal... Yeah. Uh, outrageous, and that came screamingly through in the drama. The other question, of course, is where is the money? Because if you're turning around and saying there was a deficit, the sub posts that you know where well, we should answer in where their profits. Probably, I know where it say. is. Um, very early on in the investigation, anyone who's dealt with accounts, double entry bookkeeping, every account system has a suspense account. That's where you put um, items until you know where to put it properly. Right. The suspense account on Horizon was mysterious. And this bomb-proof system was normally in credit at the end of the year between a million and one and a half million pounds. And after four years, the, yes. the, the post office directors were just pushing that one and a half million a year into profits. Well, in a bomb-proof system, you don't have one and a half million of uncompleted so transactions in, in surplus. I think if you add all that money up for 15, 20 years, that's the money that so, was extorted. So people need to look at that. Matters. So the sub-post office master, who basically had to make up the apparent deficit when there was no deficit, out of their well, own money, it's a bit more they complicated. Um, Fujitsu had told the post office it was a bomb-proof system. Yeah. Put, the post office put them on a penalty clause, £20 uh, penalty clause for every non-completed transaction. Okay. They got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds every day. They paid engineers to fix them right. instead of paying over the penalty clause. And human nature being what it is as well, someone's going to press the wrong key and instead of having a 20, 30, 40 pound problem, you've got a bigger problem you know and they were never going to admit to it. Do you know what's interesting as well? In the wider context, we're all being pushed towards technology, artificial intelligence yes. and all of the rest they of it. Make mistakes, that our yes. lives are going to be better because these things are infallible. And you, you, know, you look at this, you look at the lives destroyed and you look at the, the, the willingness with which politicians from highest to lowest were ready to say that machine is infallible and therefore it must be the humans who got it. Right. And also Fujitsu have got lots of, of contracts across government and... and several and, billion, several and, I, billion. and I think, you know, there was certainly the, the child maintenance service, which has been heavily criticised by the National Audit Office, um, they certainly had a Fujitsu system in until at least 2021, and, you know, there's lots of people who have committed suicide because of being chased for arrears there. Michael, a last question to you. Is there anything that can compensate you realistically? You know, this is... This is more than 10 years, this is 10 years of your life that you don't get back. You know, I mean, realistically, I might, what, could, I might, what could put you ahead of the Susan game Susan and I might not get that 10 years back, but I tell you what we don't want. We don't want this apathy and pathetic, I'm sorry, I apologise. I want my life and that of my wife's financially back on track so we can see the rest of our years out. Now, it was raised earlier about the competency of the uh, Fujitsu system. I was also privy at the time, whilst in office, that there was something called the Highland account. Now, people were going in and they were paying their electric bills and this, that and the other, and they were getting the receipts. And then all of a sudden, because they were on budget programmes, the service provider got on and they said, you haven't made your weekly payment. Where's, where's the money? We're going to have to take you off the, off the scheme. <laughs> Those people ran back straight away to the post office and produced the receipts and said, where's the money gone? We then find out, post office hushed it up very quickly, and believe me, very quickly, because this is the first time this issue has been raised. And the reason that they hushed it up, because that money for the Highland account, for the gas and electric and telephone, the money that Peter was being paid in weekly actually was directed into that account until the public started to raise a fuss, then it was stopped, it was closed down and the money was reimbursed. A whole other story there, Michael. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for speaking so frankly and honestly about what this has been like for you. Thank you also, Andrew Bridgen, once Pleasure. again, for uh, turning the spotlight on something that matters. I'm on another break, I'm afraid, after which I'll be joined by academic and emeritus professor of sociology, Frank Faredi. We'll be talking about the German farmers, why they're protesting. Don't go anywhere. Okay. That's it from me this week. Thanks to my guests, Andrew Bridgen MP, Michael Rudkin, Frank Faredi and Andrew Eborn. I'll see you next Saturday. Next up, the Saturday Five. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, 
Sponsors of Weather on GB News.